Okay, so that's good. And let's see. Okay, so no questions, then I can move on to today's topic. So today we are going to start chapter, oh, sorry, Canto 12, which is the last Canto in Shivad Bhagavatam and probably the shortest with only 13 chapters. And uh, um, basically the Canto begins with, oh, let, me, let me mute everyone, so. Okay. All right, that's better. Yeah. So in this uh, canto, the first chapter actually, in the first chapter, Srila Sukhdeva Goswami um, actually makes wonderful predictions about what's going to happen over the next, you know, next while. And as we shall see, that's, we can actually see some of the names and incidents that he predicted 5,000 years ago have actually happened. And uh, so that was a big surprise for me. Just give me one second, I'm gonna turn the light on. Thank you. So he describes the future kings and how they become you know, completely degraded because of the influence of the age of Kali. And he talks about many, many, like literally dozens of names he rhymes off that I can't even remember and it doesn't matter. But in particular, he talks about a king by the name of Mahanandi, who had a very powerful son by the name of Nanda. But uh, this Nanda was born from a Shudra woman. So not a Kshatriya woman, Shudra woman. And he became, uh, like when he took over from his father and became the king, he had literally millions of soldiers in his army and unbelievable amount of wealth. And he basically decided to wreak havoc among all the Kshatriyas at that time and uh, pretty well eliminated them. And from that time onward, virtually all kings were irreligious Shudras. He ruled over the entire earth just like a uh, second Parashuram, because what did Parashuram do? Anybody? Uh, Parashuram killed the... Kills everybody. Kills Kshatriyas. 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 21 times. Yes, 21 times he got the earth rid of uh, Kshatriyas. So he was doing basically the same thing. And there was no one there to actually challenge his authority. He had eight sons and they basically ruled the earth uh, for more than 100 years. And then a certain Brahman, and I'm going to let you uh, guess who that might be. A certain Brahman betrayed the trust of King Nanda and his eight sons and uh, he destroyed their dynasty. Now, do you know anything in the history where a Brahman killed a king and basically installed a different dynasty? A very famous Brahmin who was a minister, and we call him something something Niti. Very famous. Chanakya. Yes, very good. Very mm. good. Thank you. Chanakya. So I mean we recognize that you know he's talking about like Shukadeva Goswami is talking about Chanakya, which happened only I think just under 2000 years ago, which means he predicted what would happen 3000 years from the time he was speaking. Because he was speaking 5000 years ago. Anyway, so then he installed the Mauryas, Chandigut Maurya, you might uh, remember the mm -hmm. name. And uh, then he had another um, I mean, different generations, sons, grandsons, etc. And uh, they were all known as the Maurya kings. And they ruled for 137 years. <clears throat> After that, another dynasty came along, Kanva dynasty, which actually were... Uh, not as bad as others, although quite bad, but their dynasty lasted almost 350 years. So then the last king in the Kanva dynasty was 
killed by his own servant, whose name was Bali, who was also Shudra. And uh, as degraded as you can imagine, this Bali was um, just destroying everything. And he and his descendants uh, literally destroyed the earth over four, 450 or more years as they ruled. Anyway, so they came and then the Yamans came and then Magads came and you know, so many different dynasties came and went. Um, finally, there was a king in the dynasty of Magads. His name was uh, Vishwa Puruji. And he literally turned all the citizens into Shudras. And he basically insisted that nobody serve the God. Everybody should become ungodly. And uh, he also went after Chatriya uh, order and destroyed them completely. And he ensured that the Brahmins, just like Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha, make sure the Brahmins were not doing any uh, spiritual activities or following regulative principles um, or anything. You know, and basically um, in those days, all the royal order was belonged to Shudra families, Shudra class, I should say. And I think that's still continuing because most of the people who are ruling are no better than Shudras. Anyway, um, and then the Yavans came and all the area around the Sindhu River and Kashmir and all those kind of things were uh, first ruled by the Shudras who were, um, who were meat eaters and fallen Brahmins who were also eating meat and they had given up their Vedic civilization. It just became worse and worse and worse. So many uncivilized kings came you know, and then the, their children and the children's children, they, they were horrible people, really bad temper. And all they wanted to do was um, encourage irreligion and falsehood. Anyway, um, they devoured the citizens. They murdered innocent women, children, brahmanas. Uh, they, they kidnapped their wives and they took over their property. Um, you could never tell what mood they were in, very inconsistent, and basically no strength of character. As a result, they were very short-lived, uh, but they still didn't perform any Vedic rituals, they didn't practice any regulated principles, and just totally, totally into modes of passion and ignorance. And uh, then Shuddha Goswami predicted that this will go on for a very long time in the age of Kali, the low class kings will uh, rule the earth and they'll make sure that the whole society becomes completely degraded. So I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions about um, uh, the description by Shukadeva Goswami about the age of Kali. Anything? Okay, then I'll keep going. Uh, okay, all right. <clears throat> then Shukdev Goswami describes the symptoms of Kali Yuga. And again, he is describing it <clears throat> just before Kali Yuga starts. But as I uh, describe some of the symptoms that he described, because I can't recall all of them, it will be too long anyway. But you will see that you know, you're seeing it today, whatever Shukdev Goswami was describing as the symptoms of Kali Yuga 5,000 years ago. And he said, the bad qualities in the age of Kali will increase to basically an intolerable level. And when that happens, the Lord will come, uh, uh, come as Kalki, Kalki avatar, and destroy everyone who is irreligious. And at that time, Satyug would begin. And then he said that as Kali, Kali Yuk progresses, the religion and its four pillars. So what are the four pillars of religion? Anyone? Truthfulness, mercy, mm -hmm. cha charity. Austerity. Cleanliness. Yes, Cleanliness, yes, correct. So, Thanks. see, Thanks. mercy, truthfulness, cleanliness, and austerity. 
Yes. So those are four pillars. And so he's saying that religion and its four pillars, as well as tolerance, uh, the duration of life, physical strength, memory, they will all diminish day by day as the age of Kali progresses and its influence becomes more and more powerful. And then he said, in the age of Kali, wealth alone will be considered the sign of a man's good birth, proper behavior and fine qualities. If you have money, you cannot do anything wrong. Great family you come from, doesn't matter what the reality is. And, and the, the law and justice will be applied only on the basis of one's power. There is a saying in Hindi, it says, Jiski lathi uski bhas. Does anybody understand bhas. that? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if you got the power, then you can have whatever you want. You know, it doesn't <laughs> matter what the real thing is, but justice is on your side. Anyway, then he goes on to say, men and women will live together merely because of their superficial attraction to each other. And success in business will depend upon deceit. Womanliness and manliness will be just according to one's expertise in sex. And a man will be known as a Brahmin just by wearing the sacred thread. And we see that. We see that today, right? Um, a, a person's... Uh, Holiness would be just by his external appearance. So you put the tilak on, I put dhoti and kurta on, and people say, oh, and you saffron clothes, and you say, oh, Maharaj Aga, this Nasi, you know, obeisance and all that kind of things. Whatever his qualities are, doesn't matter. And mm -hmm. again, we are seeing that today. Um, the person who is very good at word juggling, a word jugglery, he'll be considered, you know, a learned scholar. Mm -hmm regardless of the depth of knowledge. A person will be just unholy if he doesn't have money and hypocrisy will be accepted as virtue. Marriages will be arranged simply by verbal agreement or a piece of paper in the courthouse, you know, <laughs> without any uh, vivas and scars. So, okay, so I'm going to ask everyone to please mute yourself unless you have a question or a comment. Okay. Um, sacred places, like we go on pilgrimage. So sacred places will be nothing more than a reservoir of water located some place far away from where we live. And, uh, and people will say, yeah, I went there, took the bath, took my bath, therefore I've been to the holy place. Um, beauty would be uh, considered depending upon one's hairstyle. The more hair you have, the better hairstyle you have, the more beautiful you'll be considered. And filling the belly would be the goal of life. Principles of religious would be observed sometimes, but they will be observed only for the sake of reputation. Oh, this person is so religious. Look at all the things he does. So many times goes to the temple, he goes to the arti, and he does yagyas, he gives to the Brahmins. That's all that's required. And sure enough, uh, the, the climate change is predicted as well by Shukadeva Goswami. He's saying citizens will suffer from cold, wind, heat, rain, and snow, all those kind of things. And I think we in this call have suffered through all that not too far, too long ago. In, in the case of Toronto, only last week. And, uh, and people will be tormented by quarrels, hunger, thirst, disease, but above all, severe anxiety. So he was predicting that 5,000 years ago, people will have depression, people will have clinical, clinical anxiety, and all those kinds of mental issues, health issues. And eventually, um, the maximum duration of life will be 50 years. That's it. By the time Kali Yuga ends, how many years to go? Anybody knows? Before Kali Yuga ends? How many years to go? I guess the is 20 years. Sorry? 20 years. 20 years at then. 20 years? Yes. 20 
So two, 20 years from now, no, there will be no more Kali Yuga, like 2000. At, at the end of the Kali Yuga. I'm oh, sorry, I'm not following you. 4,27,000 years probably. Yeah. 427,000 years, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's that many years to go before. So total of 432,000 in Kali Yuga, 5,000 have passed. So difference 427,000 is still to go. Okay, so he's saying that by the time Kali Yuga ends, the bodies of all creatures will be greatly reduced in size and there will be no more Varnashram system. Nobody will be following the Vedas. They'll basically have forgotten you know, anything Vedic and the so-called religion would be basically atheistic. Kings would be thieves. Um, the major occupation of men would be stealing, lying and needless violence. And everybody would be a Shudra. So Kalos Shudra Sambhav, as is predicted, everybody in Kali would be Shudra. Anyway, cows will be so small in size, they look like goats. And spiritual hermitages would look no different from mundane houses, actually like palaces. And, and we see it today. There are so many ashrams in India that look like palaces or retreats and things like that. And family ties will extend no further than the immediate bonds of marriage. So me, my wife, and my children, that's it. Don't care about my parents, my uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters, go away. Homes will be devoid of piety and human beings will become like asses, the donkeys. Basically, it means work like a donkey, but no idea why. Why am I working 18 hours a day? Why am I always looking at my cell phone um, to see what's going at the office? Why am I responding to emails, office emails at 12, 12 midnight? Then things like that. No idea why we're doing that, but we'll be doing it. And then he said, at the end of his, as I said before, Kalki would appear in a village called Shambhal. And his father would be actually an exalted Brahmin by the name of Vishnu Yash. And he will roam about the earth, killing literally millions of bandits in the guise of kings. And then the signs of Satyu will begin to appear. And then Sudhya Goswami said that, and there's a person by the name of Devapi, who's a brother of Maharaj Shantanu. Shantanu, as you know, anybody knows who Shantanu was? Give me a reference. Father Bishma's of... father. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bishma's father. So his brother and Maru, who's a descendant of Ikshwaku. Who was Ikshwaku? Anyone? Surya um... Dev. Manu's son, yes. Where was Manu's son, yes. So, and he's a, he's the, in the Sun Dynasty where Lord Ramchandra also appeared. So anyway, so he said, Maru and Devapi would be uh, living in a, uh, in a village called Kalap, incognito, means nobody would know them. And at the end of, end of Kali, when Kalki has done his job, then he'll co they'll come back to human society and reestablish Varnashram system and basically begin um, the age of Satya Yuga. So again, I'm going to pause, see if there are any questions or comments about the qualities as predicted by Shukdev Goswami of the, uh, of the age of Kali. Prabhuji, I just want to know the lifespan and um, the duration of the life will uh, will go down, right? For down the 50 years, 5-0. Five 5-0. Zero. Five zero. And even the size of the people also will go down, right? Yeah. And actually, you can see that even in even in Dwapar Yug, when uh, Mother Revati had appeared mm -hmm. from the age of Satya she was so much taller than Lord Balaram that he had to actually reduce her size. You may know that pastime. Yeah. Right? So people were much larger. Uh, another example, in Satyug, there was churning of ocean, right? Which ocean did they churn? Indian Ocean. 
No, no. They were in a Swarga Loka somewhere. Not even Swarga Loka Prabhu. They actually churned Shiru. Shiru Ocean. Shiru Ocean. Right? <laughs> and it's very deep. Like Pacific Ocean is five miles deep. Shiru Ocean probably deeper than that. And they were standing there knee deep. So that means up to the knee, there's five miles. So that gives an idea that gives us an idea of how big these people were. You know, uh, those of you who have gone to Ahobilam uh, have seen that pillar that apparently Lord Dessing they came out from. It's like at least 200 feet long, tall, I mean. So Hiranyakashipu was living there. Just imagine how tall he must have been. Right? So that's my point. So it's been reducing steadily over the ages, but in the age of Kali, it goes almost to the extreme. Some other things that uh, it's not in Srimad Bhagavatam, so I didn't mention it, but I've seen in other places. It also said that uh, girls as young as six, seven years old will get pregnant. And mm. uh, like there will be so much incest and all those kind of things as Kali Yuga proceeds. So it's, it's a really bad scene. I mean, we're still lucky. It's only 5,000 years old. It's only going to get worse. Okay, any other questions, comments? Uh, Prabhuji, apologize for like my ignorance, but uh, uh, I'm thinking what is the uh, like significance of if size is tall or it's small or like uh, you said, right? In Kali Yuga, the size will be decreased or something. So what is the significance of that? If, uh, okay, someone's size is taller, someone's size is not that much taller, they are small. No, it's not It's not a question of uh, uh, there's something wrong. He's basically describing what changes will happen. Uh, <clears throat> and excuse me, but and also, let's face it, generally speaking, rightly or wrongly, taller people are considered better than <laughs> shorter people. It's not necessary, but generally speaking, that's the impression. You know, I mean, uh, even today, for example, somebody says, oh, he's six foot tall, oh, handsome guy. And somebody, oh, he's only 4'11". Well, okay, fine. <laughs> just, this is general. I'm not saying character was something right or wrong with height. This is general impression. Mm -hmm. okay. So I don't know if I answered your question, Mother. Prabhuji, even uh, as we are talking about Satyuga, the lifespan was long, so the people were also tall there, right? Correct. So everything is proportionately reducing. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So basically, the age, average age in Satyuga was 100,000 years. Then it reduced by a factor of 10 in Treta Yuga to 10,000 years. I'm just talking averages. And then Dwapar, it became 1,000. And Kali Yuga at the beginning, it became 100 years. And uh, as predicted, it will go down to 50. Like these days, as you know, if somebody is 100 or over, it becomes a news item. Right? So rare. Okay. Any other questions or comments? When after Kali Yuga, when the new Satya will start, so there would be some Sandhya period also, right? Yes, or what, is, what is that Sandhya? Period? Every change uh, of uh, Yugas, this is Sandhya period, which basically overlap. It's, overlap. Like, it's not binary, right? It's not like today is uh, it's, um, 3rd of February and in another mm. um, three and a half hours, it'll be 4th. So it doesn't work that way. It's a, it's a gradual thing. It's 250,000 years. The Sandhya period is 250,000? Correct. Okay. Correct. Between the ages, it's 250. No, I'm sorry. That can't be right. Um, I think Prabhuji, 20%, right? 20% is the both so, sides. So I, I don't remember. But like, it's, it's in thousands. I don't know. It's okay. It may be 25,000, something like that. But it's a long period. Okay. And, and as you know, also, on, when we are on the point, the age of Kali this time was delayed. Mm -hmm. You know why, right? Yeah. Anybody knows why? Because Lord Krishna himself. Was Correct. 
Correct. So as long as Lord Krishna was here, Kali did not dare come in. But as soon as he left, we know the story about the bull and King Pariksha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, I read in Bhagavatam that this age, because Lord Krishna was coming, Dwapar Yug came after Treta. Generally, in other Yugas, would be Dwapar will come first and Treta means third will come next and then Kali. So that's mm -hmm. described in first canto of Bhagavatam. First canto, yeah. Yes. So there was an overlap. Prabhupada uses the word overlap. And uh, so Dwapar came first. It's just it's still very confusing because everywhere else, mm -hmm. it always is the sequence is Satya Yug, Treta Yug, Dwapar, and Kali Yug. But mm -hmm. in that particular, there's a verse actually to describe that. Yeah. It says there was an overlap and Dwapar came before Treta. Sorry, Treta mm -hmm. came before Dwapar. Right, right. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All right. Then I'll keep going. The next chapter is called Bhumi Gita. So that's another Gita now. We talked about a number of Gitas in the last class. So you can add one more to this list. It's called Bhumi Gita. And as the name implies, it's the song sung by Mother Earth. And basically, she was observing the foolishness of uh, all the kings who were uh, basically killing each other, trying to conquer a piece of Mother Earth, piece of land. And so she spoke sarcastically uh, about these kings, and which is now known as Bhumi Gita. So basically, she was uh, speaking sarcastically about all these kings who were doing so much killing and so much endeavor uh, for a piece of land. And then she's going to describe why that is funny. So, may I please ask you to all mute yourself because there's some sounds coming. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so she says, great kings, or at least those who think they are great kings, they are actually just toys in the hand of death, in the hands of death. And it's these kings the desire to um, subdue their six internal enemies, which is the five senses and the mind. And then they imagine they'll go on to conquer the earth and all the oceans and everything else. So seeing, because this basically false hope, nobody can do that. Seeing their false hopes, the earth laughs. And she says, eventually, everybody must leave this planet and go elsewhere in the was death. As have all the monarchs, all the kings, the great ones in the past, they've all come ruled for a while and they've died. You know, and it reminds me of uh, the story of uh, Alexander, who's known as Alexander the Great. I'm not sure why. There was nothing great about him. But uh, he was a very brutal, very cruel king who attacked India 20, uh, 17 times, or maybe 21 times. And uh, finally, he won. And uh, then he was ruling, again, very brutally, uh, just basically robbing everyone, killing people, and kidnapping men and women and all those kind of things. Uh, one day, a mosquito bit him. A mosquito, a tiny mosquito. But it was laced with malaria, I guess. So he got malaria. And so he had, the, he had access to the top most doctors in the land. He said, call them all. I said, cure me. They tried and tried and tried. And finally, they said, my dear Alexander, this is it. You got a very small amount of time left to live. And then you're gone. And he said, listen, I've got more wealth than you can imagine. I have done nothing but um, collected wealth for the last 25, 30 years from all parts of this land. I'll give it all to you if you can give me two years. And the doctor said, two years? We cannot even give you two days. So this is it. So credit to him 
he understood i said in that case this is what i want you to do when i die is i want all you doctors all you famous doctors to be my pall bearer so take my coffin through the streets so everybody can see that all these doctors tried but could not save me then he said cut two holes in the casket and get my hands sticking out of those holes because i want people to know that you come with nothing and leave with nothing so why are you working so hard why are you doing all this nonsense of killing and all those kind of things so very good lesson i mean you know didn't expect to come from him but that that's what he did anyway uh earth continues she says fathers sons brothers friends relatives they quarrel over a small piece of land which they must give up upon death so you do all this fighting uh ruin your relationships with your near ones and then you die and go away and unfortunately i personally know a number of people who fought with their father with their mother with their brother with their sister just for a small portion of the house that the parents built you know things like that uh we also heard very about a very famous man in india his name is singhania who was crying that his children took away all his property in billions and his house and everything and now is living outside now he has no no place to live is no food to eat this is a multi billionaire industrialist very famous singhania so earth is laughing that you know people do all that just to leave everything here upon death but she said but still even though they observing the past and what's happened in the past people will fail to realize that all the worldly attachments i'm sorry worldly achievements are temporary and ultimately the highest goal of life for anybody is to achieve pure devotion to krishna or pure love for krishna so parikshit maharaj was listening very intently and then he said to him parikshit maharaj said to shukdev goswami to please explain how persons living in the age of kali can rid themselves of the cumulative contamination of this age so remember i was talking about all the contamination uh, a few minutes ago so he heard this all and says how will the people in the age of kali get rid of all that contamination and are there any special qualities of this age what is the duration of cosmic maintenance and destruction and tell us something about the movement of time so a number of question how do people get rid of the cumulative contamination of age of kali are there any special qualities of this age i mean good qualities uh what's the duration of cosmic maintenance and destruction and tell me about the movement of time so prachit maharaj answered the second question first actually so start talking about the cosmic maintenance and destruction and he said in the age of satyu religion was complete is still possessing is four legs that we talked about a minute ago truth mercy austerity and charity and he said people are satyuk for the most part are self satisfied they are merciful and they are friendly to all they are peaceful by nature they are sober and they are very tolerant and their um uh, their endeavor their endeavor is to obtain a spiritual perfection and they are very diligent about that they're not looking for anything else and that's why so many people we hear about were performing such severe austerities just to get a spiritual perfection so that was the age of satyu and then he said with the coming of each succeeding age so treta dwapar kali yug these religious qualities they diminish by how much 1/4 1/4 so they um they diminish by all these four qualities they diminish by 
with coming of each succeeding age because of the influence of the four pillars of irreligion. Now, does anybody or can anybody tell me about the four pillars of irreligion? The hint, basically they are the opposite of the four uh, pillars of religion. So think like that. So, Prabhuji means uh, where, like, you know, how they consider gold, gambling, and all those places where Kali can live. Is it that you're talking about? No, no. no. So, remember the four pillars of religion. What were the four pillars of religion? One truth, more. Uh, Prabhuji, uh, truth, mercy, and cleanliness. Okay. So, truth, mercy, cleanliness, austerity. So, what's the opposite of truth? Lie. Lying, exactly. No. So that's the one pillar of irreligion. What's the opposite of mercy? Cruelty. Cruelty, Cruelty violence. Right? So that's the second violence. pillar. Right? What's the opposite of austerity? Laziness. Lazy. Uh, well, okay, laziness, yeah. What else? Uh, Why do we perform austerity? Mm. Or purification. Mm. Okay. True, true. From austerity comes, austerity is easier to perform when you're satisfied. And that was very difficult. So dissatisfaction is the opposite of austerity. Because of dissatisfaction, you do all sorts of nonsense activities. You know, gluttony is one example. Too much sex is another example. No austerity, right? And then what's the opposite of cleanliness? Dirty. Dirty. Mostly uh, dirty. Yeah. Uh, all the filthy places, all the dirty places, you know, and then, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? Just considering uh, what is otherwise considered a, a uh, unholy place, consider it holy. You know, so, so, for example, people like to go to uh, uh, hill stations or, uh, you know, some other places where there's nothing holy about them. But that's what they, they say. That's my holy place. That's my pilgrimage. So those are the four pillars of irreligion. So the influence of these four pillars of irreligion causes a 25% reduction in the pillars of religion in each age. Mm -hmm. Okay? So then what's the characteristic of people in Treta Yuk? What's the recommended process in Treta Yuk? Five, no. Five, sacrifices. Five sacrifices. Five sacrifices, yes. So they're devoted to all the ritual performances. And they do good amount of austerity also, but nowhere near what they were doing in uh, Satyu. They're not excessively violent. They're not excessively lusty. Uh, and they're not spending all the energy going after sensual pleasures. Um, their interests lie primarily in religiosity, economic development, and regulated sense gratification. Dharam Arthaka. Right? And they achieve prosperity by following the principles or the prescriptions of the three Vedas. Okay? Now, this is the age where remember from one of the previous classes we talked about there was only one class in Satyu. Anybody remembers that discussion? And do you remember the name of the one class? It's called Harsh. Harsh, yeah. And then Varnashram came in Tretayu. Mm -hmm. So it got divided into four um, classes and four statuses. Okay? So Brahman, Kshatriya, Vashya, and Shudra, and Sanyasi, Vanprast, Grihastha, and Brahmachari. Okay? Um, and most people in Treta Yuga, not all, obviously, but most people were Brahmanas in the age of Treta. Of course, there were a lot of Kshatriyas also. Okay, then next comes Dwapar. I'm sorry? So next stage is Dwapar. So another 25% decline in the four pillars of religion. And now in this age, people are very interested in glory, their own glorification, but they're very noble people. 
So they want glory, but they're noble people. Um, they devote themselves to the study of the Vedas. They have great opulence. They support large families and enjoy life. Now, Lord Krishna, in his pastime in Dwarka, was a good example of a large family. Does anybody want to give me an idea of how large his family was? Just give you some Between background. To one. I'm sorry? Millions. Yes, millions. Probably. Yes. One so million. Okay. Give me some breakdown as how did grow so much. Give me some background. So it's less than the Krishna had 16,108 queens and each right. queen had 10 children. No, 10 no, sons and one sons. daughter. 10, 10 sons and one daughter. Uh, uh, correct, 10. correct. Correct. And then? And uh, so again, again, all the again, children had a Again, the children, 10, 10 uh, kids. Again, again similar. similar. Correct. Yeah. correct. So, look at it this way. 116,000, just like low numbers, multiplied by 10 is 160,000. Yeah. 160,000 multiplied by 10 is 1.6 million. So, just right there, you got 1.6 million. Uh, do you know how many soldiers were there to guard uh, Ugrasen? Any idea? Soldiers, I don't know. Ah, sorry? Mm -hmm. I don't know. One billion soldiers. Um, there were personal guards. Plus all sorts of other people and their families. So billion soldiers have their families, at least billion wives, and even two children. Hum, hum do, humare do wala is up, you know, then you got a couple billion more. And they were all living in the little city of Dwarka. That's the amazing part. And they were all happy. There was no issue of overpopulation. There was no pollution. Uh, there were no traffic jams. It's unbelievable. And it was explained that the reason it was like that is everybody, um, followed the laws of God. That's the reason. Everybody followed the laws of God. So all these people, but no fights, no pollution, no traffic jams, no illness, all those kind of things. Anyway. Um, and in Dwapar, Kshatriyas and Brahmanas were more in number than the other two. And then comes the dreaded good old Kaliyu. So now you got only 25% left. So 25, 25, 25, only 25 left. So you got one fourth only of the four pillars of religion. And the, the pillars of irreligion are 75%. Sorry, 100% now. So, so as the age of Kali progresses, even that 25% will reduce to 0% eventually by the time the end comes because the irreligion will keep on increasing. People will, people will be, uh, what's he saying? People will be greedy. Uh, they will be ill-behaved. They will be merciless, cruel, and they'll fight with one another for no good reason. So that reminded me of uh, a, a verse from first canto of Shivad Bhagavatam. It says, uh, describing the people of Kaliyu, it says, Prayan alpayusha sabhya, kalo osmin yugejana, mand sumand mand bhagyo. Mand, sorry, mand sumand matyo, mand bhagyo hi upadruta. He says that in the age of Kali, people will have very short life, will be short lived. They will be very dull headed. They will be very unfortunate. But the worst of all, they will cause disturbance to each other for no good reason. In Hindi, there's an expression, umli to karni karni hai. Koi batlab ho na ho. This reason or no reason. Somehow I have to put my nose in there. You know, interfere in other people's affairs. So I mean, we are seeing, all, everything we have discussed so far, we are seeing it. And it's only 5,000 years old. So you can imagine how bad it's about to get. So that's why Prabhupada said, and all the scriptures say, get out of here while you still have time. It's going to get a lot worse. People are going to become, you know, 
obsessed with their material desires, the degree of their misfortune will increase and there will be nothing but barbarians and shudras. So once again, making the point, Kalao Shuddha Sambhava, in the age of Kali, everybody is Shuddha and they turn into barbarian very quickly. And he goes back a little bit. He says in Satya Yuga, the mode of goodness is predominant. In Treta Yuga, it's the mode of passion. In Dwapar Yuga, it's the mixture of goodness and, I'm sorry, passion and ignorance. And in Kali Yuga, just mode of ignorance. I should say just, but predominant mode is ignorance. You know, uh, atheism, devotion to their genitals and belly uh, will be the uh, norm um, and people will be short-sighted, they'll be unfortunate, they'll be gluttonous, they'll be lusty and they'll be power, uh, what do I say, poverty stricken. The women will be, will become unchaste, they'll freely wander from one man to another man and lose all shyness. A uh, true story I read about some tribe in Africa. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the place. But there the custom is that the men go to work in the fields at daytime. When they come back, they have to look for their cot, the bed. So whichever house they find their cot, that's where they have sleep. And women spend the daytime stealing the cots of you know, different men, bringing it to their house. That's how bad it is in one place. But Shudha Goswami is predicting that's going to become very close to something like that before age of Caliph ends. So, I mean, like they say, we haven't seen anything yet. So we're gonna get a lot worse, the age of Caliph. The cities will be dominated by thieves. Uh, Vedas will become contaminated by people doing their speculative stuff. Um, they'll be basically atheists and not understand that the purpose of Vedas is to, to know Krishna. Uh, political leaders will virtually rob all the citizens. Uh, they will be criminals to start with. And the so-called priests and intellectuals will be, you know, basically be devotees of their bellies and genitals. Brahmacharis will fail to execute their vows. They'll become generally unclean and the householders will become beggars. One prastas will live in the villages and the sannyasis will become greedy for wealth. They'll accumulate more money than anybody else. As a matter of fact, I think it was uh, Gaur Gopal Prabhu. I think it was him. He was making a joke. I was saying that uh, if you become a, uh, sorry, if you want to make a few million dollars a year, you should become a software engineer. If you want to make twice as much, maybe $20 million a year, you should become a doctor. If you want to make $40, $50 million a year, then you should become an um, you know, industrialist. If you make $100 million plus, then you should become a politician. But if you want to make $1 billion a year, you should become a sadhu. And that's what's happening in India. And we know the examples. We know so many examples of these so-called sadhus minting money. And that's all their business is. So Sukhdev Goswami predicted that 5,000 years ago. And then again, he says, women will become much smaller in size. They will eat too much. They'll have more children than they can properly take care of. They'll speak harshly and they will exhibit qualities of unrestrained audacity. Businessmen will earn their money by cheating. Servants will abandon a master who can't pay them and the masters will abandon a servant who cannot serve anymore because of some incapacitation or whatever. And it doesn't matter whether the servant has been there for generations, um, there's no consideration anymore. And again, we see that today, the companies have no loyalty to the employees. Employees have no loyalty to the companies they've been working for. Even if they've been working 20 years, the company has no problem getting rid of them and employee has no problem getting leaving them for another company which will pay $5,000 more. Cows will be abandoned, they'll walk on the streets and they'll be killed 
when they stop giving milk. He doesn't stop, he just keeps going. He says, men will be wretched and controlled by women. They will reject their fathers, brothers, and other relatives and friends, and will instead associate with their sister-in-law, with their brother-in-law, etc., etc. The relatives are the wives, as opposed to their own relatives. And the conception of their friendship will be based exclusively on the basis of sexual ties. Uncultured men will accept charity on behalf of the God and will earn their livelihood by making a show of austerity and wearing a sadhu's or mendicant's dress. This is what I was saying before. Those who know nothing about religion will sit on a high seat and speak on so-called religious principles. And because nobody else understands anything, whatever they say is true. People who will People's mind will always be agitated. They'll become emaciated by, uh, by uh, famine, by taxation, and gradually they'll appear like ghosts, like the appearance will be ghostly uh, or haunted creatures. They'll develop hatred for each other. Even for a few dollars, they'll do that. They'll give up all friendly relations and they'll be ready to lose their own lives or kill even their own relatives for a few dollars. Men will no longer protect their elderly parents, their children, or their respectable wives because they only care to satisfy their own bellies and genitals. People will become atheists. They will not worship Krishna, even though Worshipping Krishna will free them from bondage and achieve, you know, supreme destination of Golok Vrindavan just by chanting the holy name and taking shelter of the law. They would rather not do that and stay entangled in the material world. But if somehow or the other the Lord becomes manifest within their hearts, then the conditioned souls in Kali will basically rise above all the faults that may be inherent in the place they're living in, the time they're living in, and, and anything else that could be considered contaminated or sinful, just by uh, chanting the holy name of the Lord, they'll be able to destroy those contamination, sinful reactions, and rise above all that and eventually be able to go back to God. Shukdeva Goswami said, therefore, Maharaj Parikshit, one must endeavor with all his might to fix Lord Krishna within his heart. And he said, if one can maintain his focus on Krishna, concentration upon Krishna, especially at the time of death, then he will certainly attain the supreme destination, which is what Krishna confirmed to Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 8, text 5. He says, Antakale cha mamevu ismaran muktva kalevaram ya prayati samadbhavam asti nasti atta sanshaya. No doubt about it that that person will come to me if he remembers me at the moment of death. So I'm going to pause for a second, see if there are any questions. There's a lot of information I've thrown at you. Uh, anything that you felt surprised by or, or uh, not sure you understood, let's discuss that before I talk about two verses that are probably very, very famous, and very meaningful that I want to spend some time discussing. No? Okay. Is it just too clear or is it too difficult? Or is it too much? I need some feedback. Prabhuji, we, we have some clear. glimpse of... Go ahead, go ahead. It's much clear, Prabhuji. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, 
it's all clear. Thank you so much, Pitashri. Very interesting. Very, really. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Radhavan, what were you saying? No, we, you know, it's not confusing. We have a glimpse of all that we are seeing today. Yeah, and we are seeing it. That's how, the thing. How far to go? You know, this is the it, still beginning of Kali Yuga. So we exactly. cannot imagine what will happen, but we are seeing that. Uh, no, few things. That's right. That's exactly right. And that's, it's like, I literally dread to think what will happen, say, 100 years from now. Forget about, you know, 400,000 years. It's 100 years from now. Like, we're seeing such a rapid decline. Like, the culture, the um, um, respect, et cetera, that we had. I, I'm talking about India, you know, that we had 50 years ago. I don't see that anymore. The, the Indian dress, I don't see that anymore. You go to India these days, hardly anybody's wearing sari. And certainly nobody's wearing a dhoti and kurta, unless you go to Vrindavan. You know, it's amazing. Like, I have respect for parents. I've seen kids talk to their parents like, I can't imagine. You know, so all those things are gone. The consideration for other people, you know, um, hospitality, all those things just disappeared. You know, now parents are giving liquor to their child. Oh, you know, so much fun, you know, they sit together and drink. It's all gone. Respect is gone. So, yeah, I mean, I can see it. Uh, in my own life, I've seen such a decline in that. Anyway, let me share the screen <clears throat> and see if I can put a couple of verses that... Uh, Oh, there you go. Uh, no, maybe I didn't put it. I'm sorry. I, I thought I'd put it here. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. So I'll just, I'll just say it. So the, there are... <coughs> excuse me. Um, there are uh, two verses uh, in the third chapter. Uh, one is text number 51. And uh, that's text number 52. And so very, very famous. It says, dosha nidherajan asti eko mahan guna kitanad eva krishna sya mukta sangaha param rajet. He says that, my dear king, although Kali Yug is an ocean of force, dosh nidhe, you know, it's full of, sorry, it's an ocean full of false. Uh, this asti eko mahan guna, there's still one good quality about Kali Yug. What is that? Kirtinad. Kirtan. But whose? Kirtinad of Krishna said. Simply by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. What will happen? Mukta Sangha Param Brajit. One can become free from material bondage and be promoted to Bhagavad Gita. So basically, what this verse is saying is that it's really almost impossible to overestimate the importance of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, in the age of Kali. And just imagine how easy it is where Sikshastakam uh, uh, number two, Lord Chaitanya says, Namnamakari Bahuta, Lisa Saru Shakti Tat Arpita, Niyamata Smarna Nakara. He said, All the energy, all the potency of Krishna has been vested in the holy name of Krishna. But there are no rules. Niyamata Smarna Nakara. There's no rules about time, place, or circumstance when you can chant. You can chant in the washroom, you can chant in a funeral house, you can chant at a wedding. You can chant at home, you can chant at temple. And you can chant in the morning, you can chant in the evening, you can chant in the afternoon, chant in the middle of the night, late night, early night, doesn't matter. A, a boy can, sorry, a young person can chant, an old person can chant. Of course, young can chant. Young can chant. Um, rich, old, rich, poor, sick, healthy, doesn't matter. There is no criteria. You can chant in Kashi, you can chant in Vrindavan, you can also chant in Lucknow. Doesn't matter, or Toronto, or whatever, Vancouver. That's the beauty of this mantra. And we'll 
when uh, in uh, chapter 9 text 2 krishna says raj vidya raj guhiyam pavitram idam uttamam um, pratyaksha pratyaksha avagamam dharmam susukham kartum abhyam it is so blissful i mean if you want uh, people to start dancing um, uh, spontaneously just start chanting hari krishna mahamantra whether they understand the words or not whether they have heard it before or not some of people's hands and feet start moving <coughs> and i have lost count of number of people who have told me at the temple they have come for the first time and they told me i cannot believe how happy everyone looks that is the power of this hari krishna maha mantra but that's just the beginning the end is that it allows us it enables us to go back home back to god it by developing the love of krishna in our heart so <clears throat> uh you say well so that's probably true in every 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 other age so what's so special about kali yuga so in the next verse uh um shukdev goswami says again another very famous verse krite yad dhayato vishnu treta yam yajito mukhay dwapare paricharya yam kalau tad hari kirtana this is whatever results were obtained in sat yuga what was the process anybody what was the process of meditation yeah so whatever result was obtained by meditating on vishnu in sat yuga and in treta yuga what was the process <coughs> yes in treta yuga whatever was obtained by performing yagyas dwapar yuga what was the process dt worship dt was in dwapar yuga whatever was obtained by dt worship in kali yuga you can obtain the same thing say krishna hari chanting hari krishna ha mantra yeah hare krishna krishna hare krishna 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 hare krishna, hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare so people were meditating for 100000 years 50000 years 60000 years and not getting the ultimate goal uh, you know the story about uh, vishwamitra he performed austerities for 50000 years 50 60000 years and he tried to send a person by the name of tishanku to heavenly planets by in his own body in his material body um, and he spent the results of 60000 years of austerity in just doing that a useless thing to do because uh indra said no way you coming here he used his force put him down vishwamitra used his force to put him up he got stuck in the middle that's why when people get stuck in a no man situation people say the shanku wala hal ho gaya means your condition is yeah. shanku you cannot go up you cannot go down you stuck there somewhere in the space so again long long or very hard to do that in teda yog yagyas you need qualified brahmans you need pure ingredients ghee grains etc etc and you have sit there for a long time lord ramchandra performed five sacrifice for 13000 years people can't even sit for 13 hours oh. even 13 minutes becomes difficult right in dwapar yog is the uh, dt worship but opulent not just dt worship that we do today very opulent and again we can't do that so therefore the simple ways where you cannot make a mistake just chant hari krishna maha mantra you get the same results of course considering that you not uh, performing or other committing any um, any offenses offenses thank you yeah offenses okay okay any questions i'm going to pause again see the any questions or comments <clears throat> okay then i'll keep going and then the next chapter is the four categories of universal annihilation so basically talking about pralaya of different kinds and he said there are four kinds of them <clears throat> excuse me constant occasional 
material and final and i'll explain all those and and he said that um anyway let me explain that'll be easier to understand he also um talked about in order to explain the annihilation he talked about the uh um uh, the time of brahma and he said 1000 cycles of four ages that you treta you do upper and kali constitutes one day of brahma okay let me just uh... okay so he said 1000 cycles of this four ages constitute one day of brahma and each day of brahma is called kalpa in one kalpa how many manus anybody seven hmm? 14 14 14 yes one four so 14 manus in in uh, one day of brahma the duration of the brahma's night is same as brahma's day so again uh, lord krishna describes that in chapter 8 of bhagavad gita text 17 इस सहस्त्र युग पर्यंतम अहर यद ब्रह्मनो विदु रात्रि में युग सस्तांतम देहो रात रात्रि विदो जना he says that um same thing that uh, one day of brahma is 1000 cycles of four ages and the night is of the same duration does anybody know in terms of earth years how long is that One night and day, twenty-four hours of Krishna Brahma. Anyone? Four point three two billion years. Four point three billion okay, years so, of one night. Yeah. So day and night combined is how much? Eight point six four. Eight point six. Eight point six four billion dollars. A uh, billion years <laughs> is uh, one kalpa. Okay. During the night, Brahma goes sleep during his night, and when that happens, the the lower planetary systems are destroyed in the sense they are um they um, what do you call it um the the strong winds start the sun becomes very hot and the fire starts and the water starts coming up and everything except the top three planetary systems uh they become underwater uh for a whole night of brahma which is 4.32 billion earth years that is called occasional annihilation or nimittik is one of the four then when brahma's life span of 100 years is finished then you have what's called prakritik or total material annihilation and when that happens the seven elements of material nature beginning with mahatattva and the entire universal egg composed of them is destroyed so when brahma's life is finished basically the material world is finished as well okay and then again i don't want to go into details but it's always gets confusing if you recall you know the mahatattva then false ego then uh, intelligence and then the five elements uh, earth water air and fire all the subtle ones they created one after the other the destruction happens it goes in the reverse order and everything including the brahmand the the universal egg is destroyed completely when brahma's lifetime ends okay um only sorry when a person achieves the knowledge of the absolute truth and therefore understands the reality what is in fact reality then he can understand or he can perceive the material universe as separate from the absolute truth and therefore he understands that this is not real in the sense that it's temporary that is called liberation or atyantik or final annihilation okay another kind 
And then finally, at every moment, time is invisibly transforming the bodies of all created beings and all other manifestations of matter. So basically, as Krishna says, Kalos me. As time, I'm the destroyer. So invisibly is destroying these things. Um, maybe one of you can tell me, I read somewhere that every seven years or so, all the cells in our body are, are dead and new ones are born. Something like that. Does anybody know? Yes, Prabhu. And That's also, yeah, whatever we eat, it stays with you for seven years. That's what they say, the cells. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Mahabharat Prabhu told us, you know. Okay, what? yeah. No, I believe yeah. it. I believe it. Okay, all right. Um, so that's the final or libera final annihilation or liberation. Sorry, um, that's called constant uh, uh, liberation because not liberation annihilation because it's being is uh, dying continuously. Um, and then of course you have the birth and death, so that's the other, another constant annihilation. So the, both are part of the fourth one, which is constant annihilation. So we had constant, we had uh, uh, final, we had uh, material, and we had um, uh, we had um, occasional. Sorry, yeah. Uh, okay, all right. So should I pause and see if that was clear? Because that could be a little confusing. Well, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So. Uh, um... Is there any significance uh, as to why does Brahma have such a long life? <clears throat> or is it just Krishna's arrangement? No, I mean, this is, there is a very logical reason. Just imagine how long it takes for the universe to settle down and then how big it is, how uh, difficult it is to manage the, uh, um, the affairs, so Brahma lived only for, let's say, I don't know, uh, a million years, then nothing would be done. And there would be destruction, complete destruction all over again. So let's imagine every million years, the whole material world is destroyed. That will become, even for Krishna, I mean, a bit too much. So, so that's, that's one reason. The second reason is that, you know, um, in terms of Brahma, it's only 100 years. In terms of Krishna, it's just, just a breath, just a breath, I mean, sorry. So it's just, that's how the time works. So for Krishna, it's very short time. He breathed out and he breathed in. That's it. That's the entire duration of Brahma's life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, bro. So otherwise, he'll have to start panting. If you want it shorter, Mahavasya will start panting, you know, breathe very hard and very fast. <laughs> so that won't be very comfortable. Remember, what is he doing when he creates the universes? What is he doing? What is he really doing when he starts the creation? Excel, bro. Ah, huh, sorry. Excel. No, 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 no. Other than breathing, what is he doing at that time? Where is he? He's a nidra, I think. He's, he's a nidra, nidra, exactly. He's sleeping. He's half asleep. He's yoga yeah. nidra. So he's doing all this in his sleep. So don't rush him, man. <laughs> you know. So, so that's that's the, that's the real reason. Okay. Okay. Prabhuji and hmm. also. Um, there is someone who lives more than Brahma. His name is something to do with hair of the body. Romesh, Romesh, Astavakra and Romhash. Rom, Rom, Romhash. Romhash. What is? Do you, I'm not getting the name, but something to do with Rome. As many as we have hair on the body, something he. I'm not too sure. I don't know if you remember that. No, because I'm having difficulty understanding when Brahma is dead, material universe is finished. So where does this person go? No, Prabhuji, I think the story what Mother is telling, it's a Roma, Roma, Roma it's not a Roma Hutch, it's a Roma something. Now, the story was given, he has disciples and they were trying to prepare a shade above his head. And the significance is said that time is so short, don't do, don't put a shade on the my, you know, shade on my head, rather chant Lord's name, do service. So that was the significance. And it is said that 
you know his life how long was his life like yeah, well, it can't be it cannot be it cannot be more than brahma's life because the material universe yeah. finished there's no more material world where do you go Hare Krishna Prabhuji, I had also same thing like Ashtabhakra, his life has been far more than the Brahma. There is uh, his one pore of hair fall, something, uh, I don't know, is it true or something? So they say it's, his uh, life has been is far more than the Brahma's life. One yeah. hair fall down means his uh, Brahma's, uh, one Brahma, something so, like that. So, but my point, my question is simply, I have not heard that, but my question is, where does he go when material world is finished? He cannot go. Yeah, no not got yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, true. You know, so I, I don't understand. I, I, anyway, I'm not sure I understand. I know the story. Okay, yeah. Uttapu, you had a question? Yeah, Prabhuji, uh, like, uh, because we say like the Vrindavan, the Maya put down, it is not destroyed, uh, like after one day of Brahma. So is it like, so it doesn't destroy. And whatever the full after 100 years of Brahma's life, Still, it's uh, because see, all material universe is already there. Yeah. So, so it transcendental be because unmanifest. Okay. Yeah, this is eternal. For sure, it's eternal. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, Mother Aditi, I don't know how to answer your question because I don't know the answer. I never heard that. And I can't in my mind um, reconcile. Uh, that somebody can live longer than Brahma because where will they go? And the uh, char uh, special characteristic of this personality is that he always chants because he feels he has very little time in his life. Though he has a very long span, but he he doesn't uh, leave chanting for a minute also. There's one thing I heard in a lecture. That's what I asked you. Okay, sorry, Mother, I don't know. No worries, Prabhu. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yeah, Prabhuji, so I, I just want to understand those four. Let me hear it there. So when, is a, when Brahma sleeps, that is the one life we are talking about. Another, when Brahma's life ends, that is the second. Correct. Third, third is when one realizes uh, this material creation is uh, Correct. separate. That's the, the liberation. Brahma. Yes, that's liberation. Yes. So th that means it's a, um, you see, Self-realization, can you say something like that? Or, uh, no? um, yeah, basically that's what it is saying, that self-realization to the extent where you are liberated. Yeah. So, yes. And the fourth one is, uh, you know, constant. That means, constant. Uh, yeah, you know, it happens like our birth, death, and all the, that is uh, our annihilation we talk correct. about. Correct. Okay, Prabhu. Thank you. Sure. And I'm glad you got it. That's really good. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. And then um, then Sudha Goswami basically finished this whole point by saying that whatever I've just told you, long time ago, this information was given by Lord Nar Narayan to Narad Muni, who gave it to uh, Vyasdev, who gave it to me, Sudha Goswami is saying, his son. And, um, and a few years from now, get this, Shudha Goswami is saying, a few years from now, Suta Goswami, who's sitting right here, will speak this Srimad Bhagavatam to the sages assembled in the great sacrifice of Namisharadam. So he again, he forecasted that. And, and he said that he'll be questioned by, uh, uh, by Shona Krishi, who will be the chief of the 88,000 or 80,000 sages will be assembled there. So, as you know, in Shivad Bhagavatam, sometimes we say, well, wait a minute, if we ask the wrote it, then how come he's starting with, you know, Sudh Goswami answering, uh, Shana Krishi, and then Shuddha Goswami is coming, and Ved Vyasa wrote it, how is that possible? So, clearly, these people were able to see the future, and they wrote certain things before it happened, just like Valmiki. He wrote Ramayan before the past times actually happened. So it's their power. So Shri Goswami is acknowledging that particular point. Okay. If there are no questions, then I'll move on to the next chapter, which is basically um, final instructions. Prabhuji, I have a question. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so the Shruta Goswami, that means he was living long, 
long life, isn't it? Because he was there. Long life, but not that long. Because remember, um, this was um, shortly after um, Sudha Goswami spoke to him. Um, as it is, only 5,000 years have gone by when Sudha Goswami spoke. Hmm. Sudha Goswami spoke, I don't know, maybe 500, I, I don't know how many years, but not that many years, considering how long these people lived. So it's not like a million years, not like 100,000 years, it's not even 10,000 years. But more than 1,000 years, Prabhu? More than like 2,000 years? Could be, I don't know. I, it doesn't yeah, say. Okay. It doesn't say, but I know it's less than 5,000 because less than 5,000 5, is now. Yeah. Right. So, but when Sutta Goswami was describing the Srimad Bhagavatam again, uh, again? the when Sutta Goswami was describing the Nomesha, right? No, so uh -huh. that was after like five thousand year ago. It was described to Parikshit Maharaj. So after that, that means around. No, no, no problem. But what I'm saying is, Parikshit Maharaj heard from Shukdev Goswami five thousand years from today. Yeah. Not 5,000 years from before Sutta Goswami spoke. Yeah, yeah, 5,000 years. So after the twin, it was described to when Sutta Goswami was describing to the, all the sages. After how many years? That's what I'm saying. I don't know. It doesn't say anything. Okay, 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 okay. I don't know how much time went by. Does anybody know? Because I haven't read no, it. Prabhuji, I, I, I read somewhere, it's, it, it is in Bhagavatam somewhere, I think, of Srila Prabhupada. It's a 3,000 years. Of, I mean, after that, five. 2000, after 2000 years of Sukhdev Goswami, this was recited. That's what it mentions there. Okay, so then I haven't read that. So yeah. good to know that. Okay, Prabhu, that's answered your question then. Okay, thank you. 2000 years, yeah. Thank you, Prabhu. I didn't know. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yes, Tipashri, I have ah. a very small question. Okay. You said in Kali Yuga, we do just only Kirtan, right, Mahamantra? That, that, no, not that. Not that. It's the recommended process. We still do Shivnam, Kritnam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Padsev, Machanam, Munam. We do all those nine processes. But the main one, the recommended one is chanting. Okay. Just main is chanting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? All right. Then I'll move on. Ah. Uh, So after describing all the four types of annihilation, um, Shukdev Goswami reminded Parishit Maharaj that remember, um, even Brahma dies, Brahma has 14 different Manus in one day. I think it comes to about, um, how much? So basically 4.3 billion years divided by 14, it's about, I don't know, 300 million or something like that, approximately 300 million years. All the Manus live about 300 million years. So Brahma is living 11 trillion years. Manus are living around 300 million years. He said, but even they die. So therefore the death is unavoidable. If you are in a, in a material body, your body will die. But the soul will never die because totally distinct from material body. Uh, what's the next line? Uh, so he's saying that um, soul is separate from the body and the soul never dies. Right? But the body dies. So therefore, Stop thinking I am going to die. That's that's for the animals to think like that. Not for you. Um, unlike your body, you have not taken birth because the soul never takes birth, the soul never dies. There was never a time in the past when you did not exist. And there never will be a time when you will not exist. Therefore, you are not about to be destroyed. However, in your case, you will not take birth again in the form of your son or grandson because you're totally distinct from your material body and all its extended relationships. Just like the fire is distinct from its fuel. So the wood is not the fire, he is not the fire, 
फाइल सेपरेट थी बेसिकली एड्स फॉर एम्फोसिस द सोल विद इन द बॉडी इज सेपरेट फ्रॉम द बॉडी बॉडी इज क्रोस सोल इज सटल बॉडी इज विजिबल सोल इज इन विजिबल and it remains it remains fixed as the body changes so again then as when jatha de come or of young jatha so as the body is going through the six phases the soul is not changing therefore the soul is endless and this nothing material about it so you cannot compare to anything material and i said when the body is subtle covering which is the mind intelligence false ego is destroyed by what transcendental knowledge then you get the siddha swarup which is the original swarup which is the original identity of the soul, of the soul and and uh, contrary to the soul the body consists of the three modes of material nature and the five gross elements right so he gives the example of a lamp a lamp consists of oil the the vessel the pot itself the wick and the fire that's a lamp right oil wick fire and the vessel in which the oil is contained and the wick is stuck similarly the material body has got this five gross elements and the modes of material nature and the material body is you know is manifested for some time it maintains itself for some, sorry it's born maintains produces by products it's old and then it dies so as soon as uh, the modes of material nature dissolve the body dies just like the lamp is extinguished as soon as the oil is finished or the wick is finished so i thought that was a very nice example so basically the way he's going with all that is saying my dear king padikshe by constantly meditating upon the lord krishna and by using your logic and your intelligence you should consider your true self to be the soul and you should understand how it's situated in the material body you are not this body so therefore my dear king fix yourself in meditation upon lord krishna and when you do that the bite of the snake but takshak which is being sent to you by the curse of shringirashi will not burn your true self your soul the agents of death can never burn the soul nor can they burn the master of the soul which means a person who understands that his soul not the material body and that person has already conquered all the dangers on the path back to god it so you have nothing to worry about and he stop and soon after um basically bhagavatam was finished the narration of bhagavatam was finished and uh um uh, uh maharaj got up to go take his bath and on the way he met his mother who was she uttara no. uttara who said you know i was so upset i could not focus on whatever uh, shukdev goswam was saying so can you take a few minutes and tell me what he said so parishit maharaj gives the highlights of that and that is contained in anarudh gadu mixta lagu bhagavatam yeah. right then he to show the sat down meditation and before takshak came he had already left his body takshak really did not hurt him any he came and burn, bit him and body got burned immediately but he was gone even before that so so that's the end of fifth chapter today and uh, so i'm going to pause again and see if there are any questions or comments and then we end the class today so prabhu ji you mentioned that um, you know uh, confusion or something like that that was the uttaraj question or uh, uh, when parikshit maharaj was going for uh, taking Uttar, bath right? his mother mother was asking the question yes she was basically i couldn't focus 
Oh, she was know. also present at the, in the, you know, she was present. She was there. there. Yeah, she was there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She was there for even when uh, uh, Vajanab was uh, installed. She was there and she was called by Vajanab to identify does this uh, Murti look like Krishna? She's the one who gave her opinion. And that's why we have three deities Govindji, Gopinathji, and uh, Madan Mohanji. So, lotus feet, lotus torso. And, uh, and the face. So remember, she was only 17 years old when, when Prachim Mahaj was born. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions or comments? Okay, going once, going twice. <laughs> But it was so nice. You were, you know, we went from, you know, Kali Kali Yuga to, you know, auspicious time of Parikshit Maharaj. I think we are roller coaster today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, then in that case, thank you very much. Mancha Kalpatar Bhyascha. The Pastor of the Bhyavcha. The Nam Pavane Pyo, Vaishnavi Pyo Namona. Shila Pupad Gija. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank Hare you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.